Well, thank you very much. Uh, Pastor Eric, it is a delight to be with you here at Abundant Life. Flew over yesterday from Central Texas and have been meeting with preachers and ministers of the Word, talking about sharpening their craft. I appreciate the kind words that uh, Eric said about me. I've been preaching 45 years. It's very precocious. I began when I was five years old. <laughs> it's good to be here with him, Pastor Wayne, and with all of you at uh, this great church. Uh, your witness is held in high esteem across this country, and I just wanted to come by, and not because I have to preach a sermon, uh, but to share a word from God to you from the word and from my heart. And I want to ask you to consider with me the subject this Saturday afternoon, how not to get shook up when your world shakes down. And I want to ask you to open the word of God with me to Psalm 46. In this songbook of God's ancient church, People have been singing this song for 3,000 years, and it's got somebody's name on it here this afternoon. How not to get shook up when your world shakes down. Would you give heed to the Word of God as I read Holy Scripture? God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and their trouble, though the mountains shake with its swelling. There is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, and she shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The nations raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice, and the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord who's made desolations in the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. How not to get shook up when your world shakes down. <laughs> Several years ago, the Ocean Drilling and Exploration Company built one of those offshore drilling platforms with which we're now so familiar. It was in the North Sea off of Scotland. It had been engineered to withstand a 100 mile an hour wind if that came funneling down that narrow body of water off of Scotland. It had been built, they said, also to take a 100-foot-tall maverick wave if that got thrown at that offshore platform. <laughs> it was supposed to stand anything that got thrown against it. And yet, one morning when the tanker crested over the horizon to siphon off the liquid gold from that thing that was not supposed to go away, it had disappeared. To this day, nobody knows what happened. Seventy-six souls went with it, 30 stories tall. 
it vanished to the bottom of the ocean because something was thrown at this thing that it couldn't stand. I think of a metaphor, a contrast to that. Frank Lloyd Wright, the famous architect, built a hotel in Tokyo, the Imperial Hotel. When it was built, it was a revolutionary design because it had in it five columns that could withstand any seismic force that would hit that city. You can find pictures of that hotel standing when everything else around it had been leveled because it had what it took not to shake down when everything else got shook up. Obviously, I'm speaking poetically or metaphorically about <laughs> your life. One of the things you find out in life is the things that get thrown at other people sooner or later will get thrown at you. <laughs> it's just a matter of time. And every one of us is going to face the question, am I going to be able to stand when life throws at me what it throws at other folks? All of these psalms, incidentally, were hymns written by the ancient church out of real circumstances. And some people think that this psalm was written by one of God's people who had had either an emotional breakdown or a physical illness or a spiritual crisis. And on the other side of that, he came out with the testimony, even though I got shook up, I didn't get shook down. Others think, no, this didn't point to that, that it pointed to some kind of national problem. In fact, they point specifically to the time when a man named Hezekiah was the king of the Jews in Jerusalem, and there, there was the army of Assyrians, 185,000 strong, outside the tissue-thin walls of that defenseless city. They were finished. They were gone. They were done for. And you can read the story in Hebrew Scripture. Just before dawn, the angel of death flew over that Syrian army, and when they looked over the walls of God's city the next morning, it was an army of skeletons. God had intervened at just the right time. I don't know whether it was personal and emotional or spiritual or psychological crisis or if it was some national crisis, but whichever it was, you can write this down as a truth that leaps out of this passage and lands right in your lap. Whatever life throws at you, when God is your refuge and resource, it doesn't have to shake you down. Amen. Would you walk with me through this psalm a few moments this evening? I want you to look at this. The psalm affirms its very beginning. God is your refuge. In verses 2 and 3, the psalmist imagines the unimaginable. Did you see it? The earth cracks, the mountains topple over, the seas roar. This psalmist is situated in the Holy Land, the Bible Land. He thinks he's standing on firm ground, but all of a sudden it shakes, and like a snake slithering across a field, it opens up underneath his feet. Well, if you were a Hebrew standing in that kind of circumstances, you'd head for the hills. But when he headed there, he saw that the mountains were tottering over like drunken men coming out of a bar. And there wasn't anywhere to stand there. Well, you only had one place left to go, earth cracking, mountains tottering. Only place you could go was into the Mediterranean Sea. But when he tries to get into the water, pieces of mountain are floating by like styrofoam beach toys. There's nowhere to stand. I wonder if anybody came here tonight habitually, or maybe you wandered in, or maybe you were drafted to come. I don't know, but you're here. Truth be told, life is shaking you up. Maybe that everybody you thought was your friend has suddenly vanished. Some of us had the experience that the people we meet on the way up are the people who disappear on the way down. Maybe family's forgotten you. Maybe the person in the next cubicle even looks the other way. You know, maybe the banker's calling you morning and night. American Express has a hitman after you. I don't know. 
Maybe the landlord's knocking at the door. Maybe the doctor gave you the riot act. Maybe the land, I don't know. But life is shaking you up in a way you cannot imagine. Well, welcome to the 46th Psalm. This psalm is said, everything I didn't think could shake, shook. Well, what's he going to do? Well, look at the first word of the psalm. Because this psalmist had a relationship with the living God. And because of that, fear is not the first word in this psalm. Look at the first word. God is our refuge. It's interesting, the word that he used there in the biblical language, it's the oldest word that we have for God. When our first parents looked up from the Garden of Eden into the starry night and the sunny day, this is the word they use. It's not even the word Jehovah, it's the word Elohim. As far back as you can go in human history, all the way back to the gates of Eden, inside those gates, as long as people have known the living God, he's the kind of God who is a refuge. And because that happens when the earth quakes and the mountain falls and the sea roars, this psalmist can say, God is our refuge. It's an interesting word. It literally means a strong rock tower. Let me ask you, where do you turn? When life shakes you up. We got a lot of things we can nominate. We can turn entertainment. We can turn to substances. We can turn to other people. We can seek to escape. This psalmist said, I didn't have to do any of that because God is my refuge. You say, that's good news. But it seems like God is way out there. This psalmist makes an incredible statement in the very second part of that opening verse because the psalmist says, he's a very present help in trouble. Literally, that word means he lets himself be found when life is between a rock and a hard place. Or it could be said, he lets himself be found when life is in the straits. One of the misunderstandings I find that people have about the nature of God is that God is a good God in sunny days and good ways, but when you get in trouble, where did he go? No, this psalm has said it is exactly when life is at the corner of Rock Avenue and Hard Place Boulevard. <laughs> there is where God lets himself be found. And I want to encourage somebody here tonight because I think we've really flipped the script on this psalm. Many of us think when we clean our act up, when the wind is at our back and the sun is at high noon and everything is good, then then that's when I find God. The psalmist said, no, when everything was opening up underneath my feet, when the mountains were falling and the sea was roaring, right then God let himself be found. And somebody wandered in here tonight, and you need to let this be your moment when God lets himself be found, when you're between the rock and the hard place. That's why the psalmist can say next, if you'll look at the text of the Word of God, therefore, we will not fear. When God is the first word in the psalm, you can next say, we will not fear. What are you afraid of? Time Magazine, not long ago on its cover, did a story on phobias, fears. It listed more than 800 phobias. Now, some of them we're familiar with. Claustrophobia, the fear of being enclosed in little places. Agoraphobia, some people have that, the fear of being exposed in open places. You get down the list, there's some of them that are not as familiar as others. There's arachnophobia, the fear of spiders. I got that one all over me. <laughs> Herpetophobia, 
fear of snakes. I got that one too. You know there's even a phobia called homilophobia. That means fear of sermons. It's like that. That's right. It's one of the 800 fears. Homilophobia, fear that I'm going to have to listen to a sermon. Well, here you are. Hope you haven't got that one. Uh, 800 of them. What do you fear? Our kind of times running out of money, not having a place to live. For some people, it's just simply in the middle of the night, noises. <laughs> you don't know where they came from. Spent your life with somebody, now they're gone. And things you never heard in the middle of the night, now you hear. When God is your refuge, the psalmist said, you can say, Fear not. And we know something about this psalmist never knew. This psalmist looked forward toward the cross and the open and empty tomb. We look back at it. What was the first word that Gabriel said to that teenage Jewish virgin maiden Mary when he showed up on a house call in Nazareth? He said, Fear not. The coming of Jesus was stamped with that word. Remember that occasion when the disciples had been sent away by Jesus after the feeding of the 5,000? They were pulling away at the oars of the ship in the middle of a storm on the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus came walking to them on the waters. When they saw him, they thought they saw a ghost. So would I. You remember what he said, first words out of his mouth? Fear not, it is I. After the resurrection, when they were in the upper room, doors locked because of fear of the Jews. There he is, the risen Christ. They're terrified. What's the first word out of his mouth? Fear not. Guess what? Sixty years later, last book of the Bible, Revelation, last stop on Route 66, Revelation. <laughs> You'll get it in a minute here. It's Saturday. I know. Book of Revelation. Nobody's seen Jesus as it were, in 60 years or 70. There's a hundred-year-old last surviving apostle eyewitness on the island of Patmos, John. He hears a voice. He said, man, that sounds familiar. He turns around, and it's the cosmic Christ. And guess what comes out of his mouth? He the same old Jesus. First words, John, fear not. Somebody came into this church house manacled and fettered and bound and oppressed with fear tonight. I want to come to declare a word that can set you free. When God is your refuge and when you know him through Jesus Christ, he says, fear not. You can write it over your life. I couldn't help but think, we were sitting back in the office a moment ago when you were singing, great is thy faithfulness. Thank you very much. That's my favorite hymn. You ever know the story of the guy who wrote that, Tom Chisholm? You can look in the hymn book and see his name, Tom Chisholm. Tom Chisholm was a little guy who was basically a sickly failure at everything he ever tried. <laughs> tried to sell insurance part-time, failed as an insurance salesperson. Tried to farm, really didn't make it as a farmer. Tried to edit a Christian magazine, didn't make it. Tried to be a part-time Methodist preacher, didn't make it. But after all of those trials, Tom Chisholm took a pen and paper one time and wrote those words, Great is thy faithfulness. Everything that life threw at him, he was able to say, God is faithful. If we took time tonight and passed a microphone around here from here and here and here and here, people could stand up and say, when my life has been shaken up, I found God faithful. That's why the psalmist says, God is your only refuge. <clears throat> Look, one of the best things you can find out is just that statement. Some of us are so tough that our motto is, when the going gets tough, I'm one of the tough that gets going. Now, let me tell you something. Everything you can rely on can disappear and it will leave you only with God. And when that happens, he's a refuge. But wait a minute. There's something else in this psalm. Lean into it another way. 
The scene changes between verses 3 and 4. <laughs> In verse 3, earth quaking, mountains toppling, scene roaring. What a change. In verse 4, you're down by the riverside. You know, if I were Spielberg or someone making a movie out of this, you'd move from this apocalyptic scene, quaking, tottering mountains, tsunami scene, and suddenly you're down by a quiet river. That's poetic language, church. It says God is not only your refuge, God is also your resource. What a contrast. Everything shaking, apocalypse, and suddenly you're down by the river, the streams whereof make glad the city of God. I understand the Psalms are poetry. They're metaphorical language. They're picture language, trying to speak to realities that we struggle to find words for. The Bible begins in a garden, the Garden of Eden, where there are rivers, God's resources, and our first parents had access to those rivers. They were the resource of God. But then that river goes underground. <laughs> it comes back above ground in the book of Ezekiel, where Ezekiel looks at the temple in Jerusalem, and out from under the threshold of that temple, there comes a river. And Ezekiel says he, saw, he walked down that river. It was ankle deep, knee deep, waist deep, and then he just had to swim around in it. God's resource coming from his temple. Then it goes underground again. <laughs> it shows up back close to that temple in John's Gospel, chapter 7. Here's an, interesting, here's an interesting thing. Jerusalem isn't on a river. It's one of the only capital cities you know, not on a river. You know, Potomac and Washington, the Thames and London, the Seine and Paris and on and on. Jerusalem doesn't have a river. A river? Jesus stood up on the last day, the great day of a feast. And he said, if anyone comes to me out of his inmost being will come rivers of living water. And then John, in a parenthesis, said, just in case you don't get it, <laughs> he was speaking of the Holy Spirit that was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. When life shakes you up, if you come to God through Jesus, he promises you an inner resource that comes from within you and flows out of you. I guess you can divide people into all kinds of camps, but one way I can divide people up is either artesian people or sponge people. When you're around sponge people, they just soak you up. You feel like you're wrung out, squeezed out. And then there's artesian people. There's something inside of them that just flows because they have an inner resource. Psalm 46 says, God's quiet power is available to you. You know a river is not noisy. You go out to the Grand Canyon, the Colorado River, cut down through that thing over years and years. Uh, a river is quiet power. The further it flows, the deeper it goes, the wider it grows, it's quiet power. Now some of us misunderstand how God's power works. It's human power that makes a lot of noise. <laughs> Drop a bomb, boom, oh, that's power. You know, launch a missile off the coast of Florida, shakes the whole coast. Isn't that power? No, that's not how God's power works. Word of God says, in quietness and confidence shall be your strength. God's power doesn't make a lot of noise. Jesus said the kingdom of God comes without observation. Let me put it this way. Let me talk about God's power. Let me help you understand that. This morning, the sun came up over the bay, it went through the window into a baby's nursery, it came through some sheer curtains, and that, that sunlight did not even wake up the baby. It struck that baby's forehead, closed eyes, the baby didn't even stir. But do you know what? At the same time, that sunlight was lifting millions 
of tons of water out of the ocean, creating the wind currents that will blow it over the land and empty it, and that didn't even wake up a baby. See, that's how God's power works. That's why so many people miss it. Everything green you see around you out here, it's green. It has chlorophyll in it. God's sun strikes that chlorophyll. If that didn't work, we wouldn't have the blanket of atmosphere we have. But I bet nobody got up at breakfast this morning over coffee and said, hey, honey, the sun's hitting the chlorophyll right now. <laughs> God's power is quiet power. He doesn't have to make a fuss about it. He doesn't have to put on a big drama about it. That's why Isaiah could say, they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. There's a river. A river is quiet power. Now, wait a minute. You say, a preacher? Yeah, yeah. You preachers talk about God's power being available. You don't know the mess I'm in. I want to know if that's true. When is God going to show up? Well, thanks for asking. I want to show you right here. <laughs> Did you notice this? Verse 4, it says, God, verse 5, shall help her just at the break of dawn. That's translated, you'll notice in the margin of some of your Bibles from the Hebrew, in the fourth watch of the night, or just at the turning of the morning. When does God get busy in our lives? The ancient people divided the night into four watches. Six to nine, nine to midnight, midnight to 3 a.m., 3 a.m. till sunrise. It's the way they divided up time. Have you ever stayed up all night? I used to go out when I pastored smaller churches and somebody got sick. We'd all go down to the hospital and wait with them. And you know, everybody's talking from six to nine, having a good time. Put on another pot of coffee at nine. About midnight, people look at their watch and say, you know, I think things are in hand. I'll go on home. What's the hardest watch of the night? <laughs> from three Till dawn. Human metabolism is its lowest. People are at their weakest. <laughs> every eye screams to close. Every fiber of you wants to relax. The fourth watch of the night. And you want to ask me, when does God move into my situation? Let me give you a holy hunch about you. <laughs> when it's the fourth watch of the night. You say, I sure wish he'd get busier sooner than that. <laughs> you know why he often doesn't? If God came in the first watch of the night, we'd hug ourselves to death and we'd say, look what I did. Or not I a resourceful somebody? No, that's a terrible way to go, self-hugulation. If God came in the second watch of the night, we'd say, you know, I, I, I spent years building up the network I have. I've got somebody to fall back on. And we'd claim somebody else did it. But when it happens in the fourth watch of the night, the angels in heaven above, the demons cackling in hell below, and the unbelievers around you have to say, that must have been God. Remember the story, fourth watch of the night story. There's Moses, all the Hebrew slaves behind him, Red Sea in front of his Pharaoh's army chasing them. And at the last minute, Moses, 80 years old, holds up his rod and says, stand still and see the salvation of God. You say, when God going to get busy in your life? Let me, give you, let me give you some divine deductions, some lordly logic. He's going to do it when you and everybody else are willing to say that was God so that he can get glory in what happens in your life. As he died. Any of you recognize the name Watchman Nee? Wonderful, indigenous, self-trained Chinese Christian. I didn't know. I wish I'd known him. I knew somebody who did know him, Miss Bertha Smith. But Watchman Nee in his little book, The Normal Christian Life, tells a story about being out at a swimming hole with a bunch of his Chinese Christian brothers. There was one real good swimmer. Most of them were just 
moderate swimmers, and one of them couldn't swim at all. Watchman, he said in his old book, Normal Christian Life, the one who couldn't swim, to everybody's terror, began to drown. Went down once, went down twice, so you could see his hand up over the water. Said the good swimmer was perched up on a ledge watching all this happen. The medium swimmers were saying, help him, and he wouldn't even move. Watchman said, I began to hate that man in my heart. Help! He wouldn't help. At the last possible moment, Watchman said, he dived in the water with a few sure, swift swimmer strokes. Save the drowning brother. Watchman, he said, when it's all over, we got around and said, why did you wait? He said, look. He said, if I tried to rescue him, while he was threshing in the water, his body was so rigid he would have sunk both of them. I had to wait until he was limp, and then I could help him. Now, come real close. <laughs> Maybe you're ahead of me. God waits until mere human beings are limp, and when we're limp, he can act like the Lord. And somebody here tonight... You're still trying to run the table of what you can do. And when you're finished with that, God says, just been waiting over here <laughs> till the fourth watch of the night. God has resources for you, but he doesn't share his glory with anybody else. Well, all right. I'm going to sit down in a minute, but I put up some words. Refuge, when everything shakes up. Resource like an inner river, ready in the fourth watch of your night. So what are you going to do? <laughs> Refuge, resource. Why don't you just relax? <laughs> <laughs> Look at verse 10. Finally, we have a word from the sponsor. All the rest of this has been a narration by the psalmist. But in verse 10, it's if God says, okay, let me have a word. And for the first time, God speaks in verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. Let me give you a little lesson from biblical language. The biblical language is a very concrete language. What the language literally says is, let your hands hang down. Study the word. Let your hands hang down. You know, we talk a lot about it. You remember how much we talk about our hands? We say, man, that was such a mess. I just, what, threw my hands up. Or when we get just put out, we said, I've had it with somebody. We say, I'm just going to what? Wash my hands of that whole situation. Or we say, this situation has gotten what? Out of hand. When we run into somebody we can't handle, we say, he, she is a real handful. <laughs> yeah. We talk about our hands. They, 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 it's, it's, it's picturesque language. Here. The psalmist says, God speaks, let your hands hang down. Let me tell you one of the best lessons you can learn, church. Real simple, Christianity 101, page one, first class period. He is God and you are not. Some people have a hard time getting past the first page. He is God, and you're not. All the stuff you throw your hands up about, wring your hands over, or say it got out of hand, God's standing there says, look, relax. I'm God. A lot of us live with the illusion that we have the original problem that somehow makes God dizzy. I've not just preached all those years. I've counseled with people. And time after time, people come to me and they say, oh, they say, Brother Joel, you just don't understand how complex my problem is. And they expect me to fall out of my chair. 
They come in and say, I have, I have messed my life up so bad. I am a riddle inside of an enigma inside of a puzzle. It's too late. Look, the God who didn't resign when he dealt with Pharaoh, the God who said, I'm not going to quit when he had to deal with Nebuchadnezzar, you're not going to make him get dizzy and fall off his throne. He says, let your hands hang down. Be still and know that I am God. You know, some of us are like the neurotic rooster. Did you ever hear the terrible barnyard tragedy of the neurotic rooster? <laughs> you know, the, the, there was a rooster in the barnyard. When the sun came up, the rooster did what roosters do. The rooster crowed, and when the rooster crowed, it woke up the hens, the sheep, the cattle, and it woke up the farmer and the farmer's family. And the rooster began to note all that, said, sun comes up, I crow, the world, man, everybody wakes up. But then the rooster fell into a piece of foul logic. You'll get that in a minute, okay. The rooster made a foul deduction. He got confused. The rooster decided, not that he crowed because the sun came up, but he decided the sun came up because he crowed. <laughs> well, first of all, he became an insomniac rooster. Because he said, you know, if I don't crow, the sun won't come up and the world won't start. Finally, finally, they had to haul him off to the home for disturbed roosters. <laughs> because he... He misunderstood the relationship between his crowing and the sun coming up. We put it in the church this way, God is God all by himself. And that God says, let your hands hang down. The sun doesn't come up because you crow. I am God. And that means you meet him by being still. Isn't one of the hardest things in our culture and civilization just to get still and quiet? I mean, look at us. We can't do it. <laughs> Richard Foster, the great Quaker, said, American Christianity is a mile wide and one inch deep because we will not get away from noise, hurry, and crowds. And he was right. We're in a still place, and one reason we get quiet in a place like this is so God can speak in that still, small voice. And all of us have to come to that time in our lives when we have to turn everything off, can't get a text message, can't get a tweet, turn the TV, radio, XM, Sirius off. Everybody's gone, and we're in absolute quiet. Can you be still and know that God is God? Or do you run away from that? i got to sit down, but let me notice one thing. You say, oh, you skipped something in this song. Thank you for asking. <laughs> verse 7 and verse 11. This was a hymn, and here is the chorus. Did you notice it? Verse 7, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Look at verse 11. He says it again in case you missed it the first time. Bats can sleep hanging upside down. Cattle can sleep standing up. And sometimes believers can sleep in any position. So he says it again here. <laughs> the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Anything the Bible says something twice, he says, look, look at this again. He says, the Lord of hosts is with us. And I, I, the Lord of hosts means the Lord of invisible spiritual armies. It reminds us, well, it's like the Christmas story. Suddenly it was with the angel, a multitude of the heavenly host that were surrounded with spiritual armies we can't even see. The Lord of hosts is with us. Now, I don't know a whole lot about invisible spiritual armies, but I do like that second line a whole lot. The God of Jacob is our refuge. I'm glad he said that. You remember the story of Jacob? His very name in Hebrew, Yaakov, means tricky one. If you translated this literally, it would say, the God of the old tricky one is with us. <laughs> now, if I were running God's PR firm, I'd say, hey, God, why didn't you say the God of Abraham is with us? 
That'll look good on the marquee, wouldn't it? <laughs> Abraham, the father of all who believe. No, no, no. Well, why not the God of Moses, the founder of monotheism? Man, that, that looks good, God. Or why not even the God of David? I mean, David, you know, you see him warts and all. He had good days and bad days, but he's an appealing character. But the God of Jacob. That's one of the most pusillanimous, lily-livered, way-faced jerks in all of the Bible. It is. Read his story. There's a Hebrew word for Jacob. Jerk. <laughs> he shows up, remember, got some super glue. Tries to fool his old blind daddy into changing the will. Yeah, it's his whole life was like that. But this psalm says, the God of the old tricky one is our refuge. You know what? I take great comfort in that church. That's grace. Because if he can be the God of Jacob, he can be the God of Joel. And he can be your God. <laughs> the God of old tricky one. Put your name in that blank. The Lord of hosts is with us, verse 7, 11 says. God with us. There's a finger pointing straight to the New Testament. You'll call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. That psalmist a thousand years before Bethlehem and the manger and Calvary and the cross and the old empty tomb was pointing a finger at it said, God will be with us. He'll come and put on human skin. And I got a better thing to tell you than this 3,000-year-old psalm. I know something that that psalmist could only guess about, and that is that God put on human flesh and came and dwelt among us in the person of Jesus Christ. And if that old psalmist who went to a temple where they slaughtered bulls and goats, if he said God is our refuge looking forward to the cross, how much more can we say it looking backwards? There's the Son of God hemorrhaging to death on a stick on a hill. There's an open, empty tomb. There's the power of the Spirit of God. God is with you in and through Jesus Christ. And that brings me to the point. Are you ready not to get shook up when life shakes you down? When we come to a service at a Christian church like this, it's never just to make a pretty speech. It's always with a hope that you'll come to a verdict. I'm not up here just to be a speech maker. I'd rather be here like an attorney arguing for a, <laughs> a verdict. <laughs> you or you or you. This is all pretty stuff to hear, but have you ever deposited your faith in what I'm talking about and who I'm talking about, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that doesn't just sneak up on you. It doesn't happen to you in the middle of the night while you're asleep. When you deposit your faith in Jesus, it's just as real as when you pull up to the bank and put a deposit in that little tube and it goes into the bank. It's a real event. And I know sometimes it troubles people when you say, have a personal relationship with Jesus. What do you mean by that? Well, let me tell you what I don't mean. I don't mean that you believe that he was a historic character. Nearly everybody believes that. No, no. My favorite president is the 26th president, uh, Theodore Roosevelt. I just, I just, I I've, I've read every book I can read about him. I, I, I'm a member of the Theodore Roosevelt club. I go every year to it. I collect Theodore Roosevelt memorabilia. I have his autograph. I have his wife's autograph. I even have an Avon aftershave bottle where you unscrew his head. <laughs> I don't know. I just love Theodore Roosevelt. I probably ought to get in the 12-step program. I don't know what it is. <laughs> but you know what, church? I didn't wake up this morning and say, oh, Theodore. Uh-uh. I did wake up with my first conscious thought and greet someone who is unseen but more real than anybody else to me, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the difference. 
I don't have a personal relationship with Theodore Roosevelt. He's back there and he's gone. I have a personal conversational relationship with Jesus Christ. And he wants that with you. He puts a human face on this psalm. Everything this psalm says is in Jesus. In just a moment, one of the ministers of this church is going to come and extend an appeal to you. But I want to say this. I want you tonight to make that concrete. I wish you could imagine Jesus standing up here with a big, beautiful basket smiling at you. And you just came and put your trust in that basket. Here, Lord. I'm giving it to you, shaking earth, quaking mountains, roaring sea, bankers, doctors, landlords, friends that forgot me, all of it I put in your basket. I'm going to trust you, and I'm going to relax. You know, sometimes we preachers, we use big theological terms at church, get saved, get born again, be redeemed, be justified, be ransomed. You know what Jesus said? He said it very simply. He walked up to people and said, follow me. That means put one step in front of the, is that hard? Put one foot in front of the other and start following Jesus. And you know you can do that right now. The first step of that can be from where you're seated. You can put one foot in front of the other and start following him. Pastor Eric, would you come and would you extend for this church that invitation from Jesus? Follow me. Praise God.